okay? Hi, welcome back to Tales from the Buffalo Trace. I'm John Springfield. I'm on here on YouTube. I've got a Facebook page also, and I've got a profile page on there, both under Tales of the Buffalo Trace. So, if you want to, look me up there, jump on as a friend, or just look through, see what I got on. They are set to public view, so we can do this. All righty. Today, we're going to be covering getting into reenacting. I'm going to take a moment before we get into that, though, to say thanks for being patient with getting the videos up. Wi-Fi got sick for a while, so we haven't been able to do anything. We're getting better now, so we decided to start making videos again. My wife's my wonderful camera lady. Handles everything and takes care of that for me. So, disclaimer real quick is, on the Tales of the Buffalo Trace on Facebook, there are pictures of um, patterns. They're not my patterns. They're ones I found been sent to me over the years by friends. So, they don't all have credits with them because they found them other places. I went ahead and put them on there. So if you're the person that created these and you don't like them being on there, let me know. I'll gladly take them down for you. But I'm not taking take credit for anybody else's work. It don't work that way. I just try and put information out. That's all I do here. So they are up there only for informational purposes. And also, if you are the creator of those, I'll gladly put your information on there and give credit where credit is due or take them down as per your choice. No argument whatsoever. Thanks for having letting me use them so far. Y'all have a great day on that part. So back to this, getting ready to go into it, getting started and reenacting. First step is, how are you gonna start? Well, you're gonna find an event to go to. Personally, I cover the time periods of the French Indian War, Revolutionary War, and the 1812 now. Used to do medieval reenactments, done some cowboy stuff throughout the years, did some jousting, all kinds of different stuff. These days, this is what I like to do. This is where my emphasis is at on that time period. Now, getting started. My first event I went to was with the local group that I was part of. I knew them. It's a local Métis tribe. My family is of Métis descent, so I was welcomed in with open arms. Métis is of Canadian or French descent, sometimes Scotch, who have married into local Indian tribes. Descendants of them are now called Métis. And we're not going to go any further with that part because that gets into politics and I don't do politics on this stuff. So, going there, I wore Native American garb, which is also frontiersman garb. The people on the frontier, they couldn't tell the difference when they showed up out there between the French and the natives because everybody's dressed the same, except the French supposedly had beards. This is all, some of that's by word of mouth. I've also seen research where it says nobody had beards during that time frame. So... Be that as it may. We're not going into that part. Like I said, I'm not getting to the political side of the reenacting or anything else. I try to be historically correct and accurate. However, this is since this is now in the 2020s, we're not going to be totally accurate. Some things are going to be different, as you know. All right, so going to an event. Find a local group. You can search online. You can search Facebook, any other myriad of places. You'll find something, hopefully. And if not, don't despair. You can still do it singly. A lot of people do it that way. So, we take and find your group, find your local event. Find out if it's a juried event, that's very key to this. Because if it's a juried event, you have to submit prior usually. No set rules in this world, so. But the juried events usually require that you sit, you know, select photos, description of equipment, anything else, to be historically accurate to the time period of that react of whatever they're reenacting that day, be it 1812, Revolutionary War, whatever. Hint here, try to keep your equipment into the period where you're reenacting at and what are your reenactments you go to. At an 1812 event, while some things from the French and Indian War are still used at that time, certain styles of clothing and certain other things have changed. Keep with the current ones for the event current as in your historical time frame that that event is portraying. So, don't wear a West kit from the French and Indian War to an 1812 because it's a glaring, jarring thing. Just like if you walk outside today, look down the street, you see everybody dressed in what we wear in 2020s, and over there's wearing somebody wearing from 1950. They don't go together. It jars, it things that average person won't notice a thing. To them, everybody's wearing historical clothing, right? So, Knowledge goes a long way. 
So the best advice I can ever give you for anything reenacting is research everything that you possibly can. A lot of people have already researched it, so if you do a search on your webpage over that, you will find a bunch of articles or thought pieces written on this. Great place to start. Don't go by one certain person's stuff because one person can be wrong. Look at the general consensus across the board. Then sometimes you go to an event and everybody's wearing whatever they wore or what they consider they wore. If that's what that event does, well, that's what they do and you'll fit in fine with them whether or not you do that. If you're more historically correct, they're not going to worry about it. They're just going to accept you and have fun. That's the major key to reenacting. Having fun. Get out there and enjoy it. You don't have to be period, totally period correct. Your best attempt at first is what anybody asks. They want you to come out and join in with them. If you learn along the way and upgrade your stuff, perfect. That's great. Everybody will love it. Not saying you have to, but everybody likes the more you learn and get better at it, and you'll feel more and more proud of what you do. So, first event, moccasins. The center seam, puck or toe moccasin is usually what the Eastern Woodlands Indian wore. I say usually, there are exceptions to everything, but the puck or toe is it. And there are a lot of patterns for that out there online. There's all kinds of YouTube videos on it. I'm not going to try to cover what the experts have already covered because there's some great ones out there. I've looked at them and I enjoy the content. I'm not saying anything about anybody else's content because everything helps. My mind is... They put it out there. I'm thankful it's there. The more people putting out, the better off we are. That's why I'm doing my channel. Mine right now is geared more towards, a, you know, reenacting and getting into it to get you into this. New people coming in for questions. So if you got a question on anything I've said or about anything else too, just ask in the comments. I will get back. I'll answer you. You can check up on the Facebook page. Make comments there. I'll definitely comment there. I'm on Facebook more than I am YouTube. I'm not going to lie. Don't want to do that so all right getting into it the pucker toe moccasins a pair of leggings leggings were generally made out of wool or buckskin a breech clout usually made out of wool sometimes buckskin mostly wool it's also much easier to breathe your body breezes you know the cloth breathes that wool is usually in any temperature is better than most anything else linen but wool is more comfortable in my opinion lightweight not heavyweight Unless it's winter time, then I say go for blanket weight because any warmth is warm. Then, a shirt. Shirts were usually made out of linen or Lindsay Woolsey. Cotton is available too, but cotton was considered a rich person's fabric. It was extremely expensive. Not everybody had access to it, but it did exist. So, Muslin also for shirts was great. There's also other materials out there. Fustain, Osnaberg. There's too many lists, but stay with something at least historically accurate. Weight may be off, thread count may be off, but at least you're making the effort and people will notice that and be highly appreciative. And it won't be jarring set of anybody else and you'll fit in a lot better. You do want to fit in. You don't want to be sitting there walking down there just stand out like crazy from everybody else because it draws attention from everything else going on, especially at your first event. And people seem to flock to things that grab their attention and ask questions. And you don't want to look at somebody saying, what's my first event? I can't help you out. If they do ask you, what's my first event? But, you know, there's other people. Let's ask them. As for you, everybody would love to talk to you. And they will, but they're not going to bother you at an event. The main rule that most of us seem to follow is you do the event the way you want to to get your enjoyment and how you enjoy it. If your level of enjoyment is just dressing up, walking around, hey, we're glad to have you there. At least you're helping with background, gives a better period feel the whole time, and we love it. Everybody loves having you there. Don't get me wrong. But you need more, if you want more enjoyment out of it by talking to people, learning, walk up and ask them. There's nobody that isn't proud of what they've done so far. There may be things they're less proud of, like, oh, you're asking about that? That's, I did that years ago. I really want to upgrade it. But they'll tell you, and they'll tell you the thoughts behind it, why they made it the way they did, and how they made it. They'll even tell you where you can go buy the stuff at. They'll tell you where you can buy it at, who will make it for you. They'll invite you in. They'll have conversations about everything. They love to talk about what we're doing. 
We're all about teaching other people and helping educate the public. That's why the public comes into our events. We're not just, every once in a while you'll find some that are private, don't get me wrong, but mostly rendezvous, buckskinning, whatever you want to call this, mountain man events, over mountain men, buckskinners, fur traders, whatever, long hunters. Everybody calls it different things. There's all kinds of catchphrases and tags that you can put out there on this to help find things out. So, <clears throat> let's get into this real quick. First thing I made was a belt. Inch and a half wide or so. Now my buckle here is not historically accurate. I've never upgraded because this is hidden if I wear this. This doesn't go on the outside, it's hidden. This holds up breech clout if I'm using one that day. Here is a red wool breech clout. It's not blanket level, this is you know more of a garment level wool. It is red. Red and blue were highly used all over the place. There were some browns, some greens. There are some colors of wool that you can buy, of course, that aren't accurate enough to the time print level portrayed. And you can even go as far as finding out what they actually used to dye the stuff back then. On this one, if you notice, it's about fingertip to fingertip, which is about the correct length for most anybody that they wear. Width, usually 10 to 12 inches. And depending on body size, you may be a little bit larger or a little bit narrower. I've seen as narrow as eight, but that's for a very small, thin person. All right, this one is not decorated. The edges are hemmed. This is hand sewing. Sorry, my hand sewing isn't great. One thing I've never done in all these years is become a great seamstress, tailor, whatever you want to call it. Now, shirts. You can buy a trade shirt. You can buy a work shirt. They all kinds of different names for shirts. It's basically a shirt. Now this one was bought online. I think I gave $35, $40 for this one just a year or two ago. Just an extra shirt I keep carried around. Even has a tag in it telling you who made it, so yeah. But you can tell the detail on it, gather here, here, different pieces. If you notice, there's a lot of detail goes into shirts. And there's more simple ones too. That one is made out of muslin. This shirt that I like, one of my favorite shirts here. This one's made out of linen. Hand sewing is preferable, like I said before, but that's what we do. That one's machine sewing because it makes it a cheaper shirt. You don't have to have hand sewing to start with. Well, a lot of people prefer it. You don't have to have it. All right, so we've covered that. Leggings. Leggings are very easy to make. You take a piece of cloth. You fold it over. You come <clears throat> one to three inches above the knee. Measure it down to the ankle. This time, you'll cover another couple inches over. Now, usually about three to four, actually, but two on each side of the material, if you see what I'm saying there. That'll be a total of four inches gap. Cut it straight down. Then, you've measured out here's where the thigh comes to, say. You'll sew. I usually just start right here with one tack point here. Then I come down here to the bottom, measure across the ankle, give it just enough that my foot will go through it in case you have a high end step. Make sure your foot's big enough to slide through. Once you've got that, tack it there. Then you sew in a straight line from this point with the thigh at the top of it down to here. I usually come right up to the very edge on the top or if I leave over flap fold over, it's your choice, to there. One straight line, go over a couple inches, cut straight down, you have made a legging. Take another about an inch wide piece of fabric or cloth. You can use lighter weight, just the same weight, doesn't matter. I usually do about yay long, you know. It's gonna go from the top of the legging up to your belt, and then you want enough over that you just tuck it under, over, tie it off, and you're done. You've made a pair of leggings. One time I made it where it had a loop right there, sewed over it. Well, as time went by, that leather, it was even a leather strap there, so I figured it'd be better, stronger. Well, it's still stretched, the legging stretched. Tying it off is a much better option. That way you can adjust it every time you put it on so it doesn't stretch. If it gets wet, it stretches and starts sagging, you can tighten up. Keeps it at the right level. For your headwear, as I said, hats were worn, head covers were worn, unless you usually went inside. But apply company to outdoors, for protection, a hat was worn, or some type of head covering. Um, some people take a bandana, fold it in triangle, put it on, wrap it around, tuck out the end out the back, and tie it off. You've got a period head covering. Now, bandana, neckerchief, whatever you want to call this, 
This one isn't even hemmed on the edge. It's about 32, 36 inches on the square. And that's what people wore for it. Like I said, fold it halfway over across corner to corner, comes a triangle, you have it. Or you can wear like a hat like mine, which is a round hat. Mine's hand felted, you can buy factory felted, whatever. A hat blank, the cheapest I've seen lately has been $27. Most, that's for cheap, not for great. But it's passable. Or you can spend all the way up to $150, $300 or more for your hat. Depends on the level of hat you want and how much you want to put into your beginning. So you can do from a two to three dollars for a yard of cloth to 300, 500 for a hat. And anywhere in between that you choose the level that you want to be at. This one is also a neckerchief. And a lot of times they were rolled up like this and worn over here, just use them if you get hot. Well, you can just wipe it off. You can do it for whatever. You get in a battle, it can come right off, untie real quick. It becomes a tourniquet real quick. It becomes a bandage, becomes a sling. And I can use it to tie that piece up over there that's fallen down or anything. So it's got lots of uses. If I'm outside and it's real windy, I'm wearing my hat. My hat's going to blow away. I can fold up both sides. I keep one side, as I said, right up here. In my other videos, I'll, so you can watch those if you want to see the exp explanation for my hat and why it is. I can fold up the side, put this over, tie it off. It'll keep my hat on my head and still put guide sunshade or keep rain off of me, at least in the front. So there you go. That's a beginning outfit. Next level's up. Oh, oh I also do wear an overbelt right here. This one's three inches wide. This is a hand forged buckle. So that's preferable as a hand forged buckle usually. You get a lot finer. And the hat has a hat band on it and a feather in it. Next step up, over here, Possible's bag, powder horn. Yeah, oh, over here, sorry, I got a canteen. This is just a glass bottle with suede over it and a leather, you put a strap, and a knapsack, haversack, whatever you want to call it. Just depends on the area and whose terminology you're using. Varying degrees of decoration on all of them. Some are super plain, some are cloth, some are leather, some are buckskin. Could be whatever the tech period fabrics were. Your choice. You know, they make haversacks out of canvas and linen. I've seen a few out of cotton, but like I said, cotton is not preferable for that because it's not, it was highly expensive and it's a bag that's going to be out in the elements. So you want something that's going to have plenty of room to carry what you need in. That way you can carry your cell phone, your bill, fold everything there and still carry it with you, don't lose it. You'll pick out which bag you're using it for. Mine, everything goes in my haversack because my Possible's bag carries my stuff for my rifle. Possible's bags were mainly for that. If you don't have a rifle, well, use it for whatever until you get a rifle, smooth bore, whatever you want. Now, then you want to dress up a little bit more. You can look for a period necklace. You can look for Oh, let's say brooches, trade silver brooches, brooches, whatever you want to call them. Then you've got <clears throat> other types of decoration of just whatever you find that you like. You'll see at events. I'd start off with no decoration. That takes a lot of work. You're trying to get into it cheap, probably like I was. And that's all you need to do is just a shirt, pants. And you can buy the pants, the breeches also to start with, and stockings. You can buy the shoes. If you don't want to make them yourself, you can buy them. They are more expensive. You can buy the turnbuckle shoes, you can buy <clears throat> the trekker boots, whatever you like. Just make sure that for period you're portraying, they are accurate. That's all anybody asks is keep it in the time period and keep it pretty much accurate. People who work with you, there may be people, if you get with a local group, they may have the loaner stuff for you even. So you can at least get into it and get started. Or they'll show you what their bare minimum is. That's another option, like I said before. But that's what we do and we want you there be glad to have you come in talk to people see what our people portray on buying our items spend your money wisely a lot of times you'll see something that looks great to you if you're new to this because it looks like what he had over there because you don't know the difference it's the same as you don't know from time period to time period what's actually correct till you learn if you know before this hey i'm glad to hear it Education is awesome. Knowledge is even more powerful. But if you don't know, be careful on buying it because I can show you knives that look totally period correct, that are made out of the wrong steel, 
are made the wrong way or they're modern machine rolled or stamped out and they all look so uniform that you won't know the difference between what a handmade knife was you know by a blacksmith versus modern machining the steel may be incorrect maybe a modern alloy instead of what we had back then the edge bevel will probably be incorrect you'll spend hours filing the thing down with a file and hopefully you get it right and not ruin the blade just to get an edge onto it just so you know buy once you'll be happy so be careful on everything you buy try and research it prior don't just trust somebody's word oh this is period correct seen a lot of people don't know about period correct or they have you know they've got some bad knowledge there they're not trying to misinform you they just don't have the proper knowledge so buy the things that you need if you need to but please try to make sure the period because i don't want you to spend a lot of money on something that most people won't buy from you you know if it's something that's period correct you can always sell it down the road if you don't like it, it doesn't fit your thing and be careful of where you put your stuff together because while this is period correct and that's period correct, they weren't put together that way usually. You want your everything to look like you came out. Same thing as if you're a working cow hand on a ranch, you're not going to look like a businessman in New York, even though both fashions are totally accurate for 2024. Because you're not going to wear see somebody in a suit a suit, shirt, and tie, and coat with cowboy chaps and jeans and boots on, usually. And if you do see that, well, it could be kind of crazy. So just giving you some advice there. Take it for what it's worth, as you paid so much money for this from me like nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what my word's worth here, what you take from it. So thanks so much for signing in, looking at me. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. Follow me on Facebook if you get a chance. Follow my videos. Have a great day, and thanks for stopping by here at Battelle's of the Buffalo Trace. I think that'll be enough for today. See y'all later.